You're listening to The Bomb Bad General. General? Hey, 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 welcome to The Bomb Bad Generals, episode two. This is one of your hosts, Seth Roach. And this is another one of your hosts, Matt Bronson. And sadly, the third host, Todd, uh, could not make it today. He is still in a food coma after Thanksgiving, but rest assured, doctors have told us he should be out of it by the time next episode rolls around. So we'll finally get him on the cast for episode three. So to start off, we're going to go to the segment, what list are you running? And Matt's going to start us off. Go for it, Matt. Yeah, so this weekend, I actually had a local. I got two rounds in with a Din Luke list. And this is actually the latest in a long line of me trying to get Din to work. I think basically ever since back in July when Lone Star Open finished up, I've been trying out Din in a few different lists. I probably have about 15 games with him under my belt in a few different combinations in both Rebels and Empire, and I have a lot of thoughts about Din. And not just Din, we decided let's flesh it out and uh, make it a Bounty Hunter tier list episode. They're pretty big in the meta right now, I would say, Mm -hmm. and I don't think they're really going anywhere. Most of them were either just errated with new cards coming out in card pack two over the summer, or were just released in this latest round of updates uh, with IG-11, IG-88, and DIN all coming out in October. We all know that there's a points update coming in December, so uh, we just really wanted to touch base on something that we know is not changing. How we are categorizing bounty hunters is any mercenary with the bounty keyword old man boba who's coming out in december no bounty keyword so (laughs) no bounty we aren't gonna be ranking him today i think to start off with we already mentioned him let's just dive right into it din so i guess before before i go on my rant seth you do it go on your rant no you've played din a few times you've played against him a few times what has your experience been playing against din what have you thought when you're standing on the other side of the table from him I think one of the biggest things he struggles with, he struggles with two things, in my opinion. One is not a big ranged dice pool. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it's like, there's like, he gets two damage in. uh, He has no sharpshooter as well. No sharpshooter. No sharpshooter. You got to, you know, and so, um, and you got to spend the aims for pierce on that. So no inherent pierce. He's got surge to crit going for him, but like with three dice, like it's just not as strong. And then, I mean, melee, like he can do damage in melee and do well in melee, but he has no way of getting out of melee. Again, like any unit can capture Din. A core unit can capture Din. You could just feed him a naked stormtrooper squad and you might tie him up for a couple turns. He's just not mobile when he gets in melee. Yeah, Din, for me, when I was playing him, it almost felt like um, a bad addiction that I couldn't break, but I knew was bad for me, right? Because he has enough things that you're always like, oh, he did something in this game. I wasn't too happy with how, Mm -hmm. with how it went down, but oh, he did have that turn where he did two speed, three moves, relentless, used his flamer to wipe a six man squad, right? Or A, his mobility was really strong, or there's always something where it's like, well, that is a unique Din thing that he's bringing to the table. But overall, I never really felt like he was bringing 140-ish points of value. The reason I'm saying 140-ish points for Din. So I think you want, or even I think he needs the jetpack. 100%. That speed three, jump two, that is really what sets him apart. You really want his Amban rifle. You really want the flamer, I think, for that huge punch because he doesn't have a big punch otherwise. Once you've got those, you're already sitting at 138 points. And that's before you add things like tenacity, seize the initiative, things like that. So you, the builds I've been running him at, I've had the jetpack, flamer, rifle, seize, and situational awareness or C's and tenacity. So those are coming out at 145 and 147 points. So he is a lot of points. A lot of the other bounty hunters that we're going to be talking to are coming in at that 120 range. Yeah. He's got to do a lot more to justify those extra, that extra cost. At that cost, he feels like he needs to be your main guy. You have to fit the rest of the army 
around him, and he is mm. not a particularly good Jedi hedge. So when you're spending yep. 140 points on something that's not really great against Jedi, that's already going to be a bit of an issue. So that's part of the issue. He's costed like he's going to be probably your 1A when really he's a 1B at best. And there's a lot of 1Bs that can do it cheaper. And really, when we're talking competitive, like everything comes down to points at the end of the day, right? Like when we're saying Din is underwhelming, he's underwhelming for an 140 point character. If he was 120 points, now it's a different discussion. One of the other things for Din that we haven't touched on yet is his command cards are just kind of meh. Like, I like how they're kind of old school and simple. Like, the one pip. Get a dodge, get relentless. Straightforward, great effect, right? If you bring Din, you gotta bring his one pip. That's his critical card for me. His two pip, where you can do an attack and then you can do another attack against a different target. It's fine. Um, not crazy, but it's decent. But I would leave it at home in some circumstances. And his three pip... I'll be honest, I've never been a fan of it. Um, I've never put it in my list and I've never missed it because it, the timing is just clunky. I think ideally mm -hmm. with Din, you're using the first turn or two when everything everyone is positioning, you're using his amban, just moving, putting a couple yep. wounds on things. And then you dive with the one pip, flame or something. You know, next turn, you jump into melee with something, punch it, shoot out of melee with his two pip. And then at that point, his three pip whistling birds, if you're still surrounded by three good targets for whistling birds, then he hasn't done a very good job. It's swingier. I'd rather just yeah. play a different command card, move attack in that scenario. So it just never really fit for me. So he's also a main character who doesn't really have great cards to build around. Yeah, for sure. And then probably one of the last things we'll, we'll highlight is, I think in Rebels especially, he really suffers from the mercenary rules and having that rogue affiliation because a lot of the rebel heroes kind of what you want is is them supporting each other with their command cards. You know, you think if you could put him with Cassian and use last stand on Din so Din gets a bunch of tokens, that would be great. Or you use Cassian's recover card so that Din can get a free recover in danger sense. That would be great. Or use him with Luke and just play like my ally is the force and give him a dodge and an order. But you can't do that because the good rebel heroes to synergize with, they don't have the command slot for underworld connections. And you don't really want to put underworld connections on them. And then before we finish on Din and rank him, I don't have much to say about Grogu. He's a trap, in my opinion. He's 17 points you know once you're putting Grogu on the 145 point din you're looking at 160 ish points you could pay 170 and you get commander luke with force push and commander luke isn't great but now you have a melee character with force push instead of someone without force push i've seen Grogu be effective but he's not a consistent effectiveness when we talk about competitive lists we're talking about lists that where you have to go 6 and 0, 7, 8, 9, sometimes 10 and 0 at the really big tournaments to win. And the chances that you get through all those games where there's not one game where the downside of the victory point part of Grogu doesn't affect things to the point where you lose, even if it's not directly because they claim the token, but because either avoiding them claiming the token or playing more conservatively with Din, for whatever reason, it's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen over the course of a long tournament. It's too much of a liability for not enough of a payoff. So we've been harping on Din for a while. Um, in my Bounty Hunter tier list, I'm putting him at the C tier, which for me is just meh, replacement level Bounty Hunter. I ranked it 136. I ranked him number six just because he's the most expensive. Mm -hmm. and everything we just said. Let's do another bounty hunter. Who do you got for us next? Let's go to Bosk. How I built him, I just took Bosk with targeting scopes. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily need any more upgrades on him. With targeting scopes, he comes in at 109 points. That makes him the cheapest bounty hunter. One of the things I love about him is that he is long range. And so a lot of bounty hunters are really up close and personal, but Bosk is, you can hang him back at range four and still get a lot of great damage in. And so he has, he provides that long distance 
support that a lot of bounty hunters don't normally provide. Yeah, you don't normally want to take the one pip. It's not it's not great, but his two and his three pip are very useful. He is rocking seven wounds, um, but recently with his independent surge too, really like helped him a lot on his defensive capabilities. I, I would rank him number four for me out of the six. Yeah, what's your thoughts? Okay, I agree there is a lot to like about Bosk, but I ended up also putting him in that kind of C meh tier for a couple reasons. While you can run him really cheap, either with scopes or in my LSO list, I ran him with just Hunter at 111 points for some extra aims. I do think that outside of the lying in wait turn, he can be pretty chip damagey, even though he's doing it from range, maybe he's only getting on five dice surge crit. If you're not getting aims, you are only maybe rolling one or two crits on average. Sometimes he can spike, sometimes he can whiff. So the thing yep. about that is it's like, well, now I'm paying a lot for someone who's doing chip damage in a meta where we have a lot of outmaneuver dodges that kind of limits his targets and regenerating is great, but also we're also seeing a lot of bikes and those bikes can come in and just mm, hit yep. him hard. I think you can spend your points a little bit better elsewhere. I don't think he's a bad call, but I think you can upgrade in some circumstances. Would you rank Bosk over Din or under Din? See, this is why I like just doing tiers because they do such different things. As you said, like one is the ranged guy, one is a much more of a, a mobile brawler. I think at the end of the day, I would still put in Bosk above Din just because that price point. But they do, they're kind of polar opposites. One is hang mm -hmm. back, ranged doing all that one is get in there mobile in your face yeah so it's hard to compare directly but i think the points edge bosk into that uh that spot so for our next one let's go to one of the guys i've been really enjoying when i swapped out <laughs> Dean for him you know who's coming ig88 oh, yeah. other bounty hunters they have some tricks they do a lot of cool things for the most part, IG-88 is just a big, fat laser beam. He <laughs> kills things. He's actually the best bounty hunter when it comes to collecting the bounty because he has that mm -hmm. permanent one pip where when he attacks a unit with a bounty, and remember, anyone can put the bounty target there. So if, mm -hmm. if you have a double bounty list, you can put two bounty tokens out. His ability works on either one of them they cannot spend tokens defensively when he attacks them. And that is great. That turns mm -hmm. Jedi into regular red non-surging saves. 50-50 yeah. saves. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. His two pip gives him an aim whenever he orders himself. So kind of like target, but not quite. So I like to play that early so that he gets an aim from that. Then when he plays yeah. his one pip after that, he starts the turn with an aim. And then when he plays yep. his two pip, he gets an aim from the card and an aim from ordering himself. Hmm. And then he has yep. seize. I like to run him with seize the initiative so that he gets another turn where he orders hmm. himself yep. and targeting scopes because he rolls. If you're combining his pools with arsenal at range mm -hmm. three, you get three black, three white. So usually you'll have maybe a couple whites and a black to reroll. So you'll get mileage out of the three rerolls with targeting mm -hmm. scopes. So with that yeah. setup, just C's and scopes, you're sitting at 119. That's a really good price point. One of the things I love about him is that he has armor one and that negates a lot of chip damage. So like barks, you're, normally you have your IG and light to heavy cover. Uh, and so that negates a lot of the bark hits. It's great against snipers because if you're in heavy cover, well now it's light cover with armor one, they're crit fishing. So it gives them survivability there. One of the things too, honestly, before I played IG, I thought, <laughs> impervious without surging red saves you're only adding 50 50 dice like it's not that good but i've had a surprising number of rolls where you just roll pretty well with it and you it don't take as much yeah. damage you know that happened it, at uh yeah gsg you know it happens it feels like every other game with ig so even that is really good repair it helps is really cheap oh yeah ig88 goes in empire Dell. they have a nine point repair droid they have dell oh, who's yeah. usually that is 
What does Del care? You know, the, the repair two on his card is kind of forgotten about. Now he can take yeah. two wounds off of IG-88. I talked about how, you know, IG doesn't have a lot of tricks. That's mm -hmm. mostly true until you get to his two pip, a machine made for killing. So it gives an aim on the card. So as we said, you get two aims if you order yourself with it. Then it gives steady and demoralize three. Now he has a turn where he can double move and shoot something at range three. So that's, you know, if he goes in a straight line, he's touching almost range five at that point. Or he's moving, shooting, and doing some other action like tapping a vamp or move in, shoot, move back for range control. So that's really, mm -hmm. really useful. But the other side, Demoralize 3, is surprisingly good. We don't see a lot of Demoralize, but there's a couple things you can do with it. You can kind of do like a mini Master of Evil play, or if you have IG in the front of your lines and they're trying to dive with Maul, or a mm -hmm. Force user who wants to move in and stand by, Demoralize 3 just says, hey, you're in range two, take some suppression. Now your standby goes away, after I go with IG-88, someone else is going to withdraw, or if you're engaged with IG-88, heck, whatever, I'll, I'll lose an attack this turn, I'll withdraw, and now my whole yep. army will shoot you because you can't re-engage me. So he can turn mm -hmm. off standbys with Demoralize, which is a very strong and sneaky play. So at the end of the day for me, I'm putting IG-88 in my A tier. I think the one thing he's not fantastic at is as a Jedi hedge. Yeah, I'd agree. I put him I put him number two. And so mm -hmm. I think he's the second best bounty hunter out there right now. So our next bounty hunter we're going to talk about is Cad Bane. Oh yeah, here we go. Like his three pip is great. His three pip's fantastic. Honestly, we can get into this a bit more. I think one of the best ways to use his three pip these days is to not divulge it. One of the really strong things about Cad is if you don't divulge the three pip, and you play it early to put down a token in your backfield for here I am, then Cad can go crazy aggressive going out there, end his turn in the open, but collect a bounty on an mm -hmm. officer in the backfield. And then, whoops, you guys can't shoot me. I'm all the way back on my side of the board because start of the next turn, flip the token, here I am, he teleports back. Yep. Or, yeah. as we said, Electro Gauntlets. So this is where Cad comes in as a little bit of a Jedi hedge. Immobilize three, if he's doing a wound to a force user with electro mm. gauntlets, they can't burst of speed out of that because Correct. that is gonna immobilize anything. A Mando unit, a Jedi with burst of speed, nothing's getting out of there. And then critically, unlike <clears throat> Din, he can then move out of that engagement, right? Mm -hmm. Or you smack them with your electro gauntlets the Jedi's immobilized, and then you say, hey, you know what? Start of next turn, poof, I'm in my backfield again because of here I am. You're stranded yep. out in the middle of the, the field with three immobilized tokens and my whole army is going to shoot you. Now, does objective tokens follow him when he teleports? They do. So you could grab a center box and he would teleport back with that so there's a there's a lot of good stuff that you can do with that so where did you rank cad then in the end i ranked cad bane number three right under ig88 same cad is in the b tier for me i think he's just a really annoying thorn in your opponent's side you know mm -hmm. for that price point for 120 that's good not everyone needs to be a laser beam that kills stuff sometimes you can just be a guy who annoys your opponent, can do a couple different things, pick off some stuff around the edges, and uh, be a presence that you have to deal with. So for our next bounty hunter, let's go next with IG-11. We'll just get it out of the way. Bounty programming for five points, a very good card. All of his weapons get either pierce one or suppressive, depending on who you put his bounty token on. So this one does matter for his token. Uh, I think usually you want to put on a commander if you can to get Pierce 1 on all of his weapons. The thing about IG-11 is he needs to be in very specific places, I find. His I agree. one pip, he needs to be at, a, at range 2, not range 1 to 2, so it's a little bit of a donut. Mm -hmm. And 
his self-destruct card, he wants to be in the middle of your opponent's army to blow up and hit as yeah. many things as possible. And remember, if his bounty's on commander, his self-destruct gets pierce one, which is pretty great. Mm -hmm. So he needs to be in very specific places, but he has AI aim and AI attack. So early turns, you don't want to be giving your orders to him, right? Usually you want to give them on some key pieces and let him just yep. whatever double move into position he can't do that he'd have to sit there and aim or attack first probably aim if you're trying to hide him and then move i think the best thing for him is putting him in a land speeder and i think a lot of people are kind of coming around to this idea that ig in a land speeder is where it's at for him because then he can get into those positions i run him with bounty programming i think if you want the bomb to go off you want to have stims in that gear slot. I would play that generally when he's at three wounds. Instead of doing two wounds to kill him and get him out of the way before he explodes, now someone has to do four wounds to him, which is pretty tough with armor one and impervious. Even a Jedi will have difficulty doing four wounds to him. And then I like up close and personal because he's gonna be doing a lot of attacking at range two anyways, but I think it's kind of hit or miss. So once again, he's coming in at that 118, to 123-ish ish range for me. Some of the problems I have with 11 is, one, you have to take the three pip, and I think in Rebels, your three pips are a high commodity. Mm -hmm. We've explained a great way to play him, but the thing is a lot of people know like when his two pip and when his one pip is coming and when his three pip is coming. So you, it's he's very linear mm -hmm. in his play style. Um, now, once it goes off, it goes off hard, and it's really good, but it needs to go off perfectly without a hitch and again what we talked about like going six rounds i don't think you can do that consistently for six rounds against good players against really good players right who, who will punish linear play for me ig11 his ceiling is incredibly high i've had a game yeah. of payload where he exploded on my opponent's payload and now you don't have an army because ig11 killed everything it could swing the other way, and if he's not really getting into those positions he needs to, he's not much of a threat. That's why I'm putting IG-11 in that C tier with Din and Bosk. I think he's got a really high ceiling, but I, the consistency is not there for me for competitive play with IG-11. I ranked him number five, actually between Bosk and Din. I would mm -hmm. still take IG-11 over Din but I would take Bosk over IG-11. Again, they're very list dependent. I'd probably take Din over IG-11 just because he can be a little bit more self-sufficient, but they both need armies that can really make him sing for sure. So our last but not least, Empire Boba, the legendary Boba Fett. Boba Fett? Where? So Boba, he comes in at 120 points. Um, I love Boba Fett. I hate playing against him. I love playing with him. Um, one of the things I love about Boba Fett is his Sharpshooter 2. Mm -hmm. Sharpshooter mm -hmm. 2, I think, is one of the best keywords in the game. It negates all of your low profile. It gets, negates all of your cover. He doesn't have a lot of big dice pools, but no one benefits from cover against him. They're all doing work. Whenever he's yeah. rolling hits, unless he's shooting into armor or something... They're all doing something. Out of all the bounty hunters, he's the only one with an inherent speed three. He's got six command cards, so you could build him however you please. Favorite command card, his one pip, the immobilized two. The whip cord. Is huge. The big whip cord. Whip cord. Not, and as a distinction, it just gives out to immobilize tokens. He doesn't have to attack them. He doesn't have to do anything. Just free action to immobilize, to suppression. It's fantastic. And I should clarify, we're saying he's got six command cards because currently... Uh, what has been announced is that Empire Boba is going to have access to all of the uh, Rebel Boba command cards and the Rebel Boba gear, which has been spoiled uh, with some people getting the, the package early. It's a five point flamethrower with spray, one red die, blast, suppressive, melee range one. So Din's flamethrower, but three points cheaper. Like for five points, you don't even need to bring his two pip. A, a flamethrower on demand is way better than a flamethrower that you have to play a command card for. I think for me, it's kind of optional. Like it's a it's a nice to have upgrade, 
but I don't really want Boba to be the guy in the lines. I think some people are really excited to just charge him in there with making his way in the galaxy, bury him in melee, punch stuff, shoot his gun with versatile, all of that. But I think for me, where I really want Boba to be is at range two, hitting things with five black dice, bouncing out, coming back in, hitting something else, staying mobile. I like Boba with just seize the initiative. I've been running him with other characters who have command cards, so that's why I want a bit better order control on him, but you really don't have to put a whole lot on him to be effective, so you can keep him at that 120 po price point. You can yeah. bump him up if you want, but he's fine at 125 with just Seize. Spoiler alert, Boba is my S-tier bounty hunter, obviously, and I'm sure he's your number one. For me, he's the definition of S-tier because he sets the bar, and for pretty much all of these bounty hunters, you can take them all in Empire. So if you're taking any other bounty hunter in Empire, I think you just have to think, well, why am I not just taking Boba? Exactly. He's got the speed, he's got the guns, he's got a very competent Jedi counter with his whipcord, and he's not too bad at collecting bounties. He sets the bar for bounty hunters, he's very versatile, he could fit and go up against any army, and he has a plan for it, just like a good bounty hunter does. So, I guess, again, we can close out this segment by running through a recap of our rankings. So for me, in my S tier, I had Boba. In my A tier, I had IG-88. And then in my B tier, I had CAD. And then in my C tier, I think you can kind of interchange them depending on what you're looking for. I've got Bosk, IG-11, and DIN. And then for me, very similar, one, Boba, two, IG-88, three, CAD Bane, Bosk. IG-11 and Din at the bottom. That's it for our main segment, and now we'll head to the break. This episode is brought to you by Blue Milk. Now you might be saying, Matt, what is Blue Milk? And I'd say, listener, listen, it's milk that's blue. It does exactly what it says it is. They've been sending me some free samples, and I gotta say, I put it on my cereal, I put it on my weird Star Wars cereal, I put it on everything. If you like milk, you'll probably like Blue Milk. And you might even like their newest product, straight from the teeth, Green Milk. Try it out wherever Blue products are sold. Alrighty, and welcome back to Bomb Bad Generals. It's time for two of our quicker segments now, starting with the top tactical tactic. Seth, what have you got for us today? Man, today, Matt, our top tactical tactic, we are talking about Pierce and specifically utilizing the Pierce keyword on non-Pierce units. Um, one of the things is, is I've seen people shoot Pierce into units that have either impervious or immune to Pierce. That is not using Pierce to its highest potential. You always, almost always, want to shoot your Pierce weapons into units that don't have immune to pierce or impervious the reason is obvious is because they can negate that pierce yeah i think there are some edge cases you know knowing the exceptions to the rule and i think that's mm -hmm. when you get more than just little chip damage or you're very certain that you're forcing saves because whenever i can force saves on something like boba fett or a jedi that's pretty good so if i have a sniper and i can shoot boba fett or a Jedi in the open, now I can hit, now I can hit them for two and maybe put some damage on them. If you are shooting into something impervious, there is some weird edge cases with lethal these days where you just want to spend it for more hits, either through marksman or rerolling dice, instead of spending that aim for pierce. So one case I have, you know, Del Mico is pretty popular in this meta, he's got Marksman and he's got Lethal. So let's say you're shooting Boba Fett with Del Mico. You have one crit already and you have another hit that you could turn into a crit or you could spend the aim for Lethal. If you spend the aim for Lethal, then an impervious unit like Boba Fett would have to roll a blank, at least one blank on his two dice to take a wound. So why not instead just turn that hit to another crit and now 
It's two with no pierce, he's still rolling two dice. If he blanks out one of them, he takes a wound, but now you have upside that maybe he blanks out both, and I do two wounds. Absolutely, and that is your top tactical tactic. For our final segment, we got the key keyword. Matt, what do you got for us? All right, so I wanted to talk about immobilize because it is a big part of so many bounty hunters kits, at Mm -hmm. least Boba, Cad, and Din. I guess for the keyword, technically we're talking about immobilize X. So the important thing with immobilize X is that when you attack someone and you have that keyword, they have to suffer a wound on the attack to take X immobilize tokens. So immobilize one, essentially giving someone one immobilize token, for the most part, that's okay. If you're spending a lot of the units in this game are speed two, that's kind of the standard speed for trooper units at least. You're turning them from a speed two move, which is roughly six inches, to a speed one move, which is roughly four inches. Yep. That is an effect, but it's not super powerful. And it's definitely not like a a way to hedge against Jedi. Versus if you hit an a speed two unit with two immobilized tokens, suddenly they go from six inches of movement per move to zero. They're not going anywhere. You know exactly where they're gonna be and how they can influence the objectives in the game. It's a very strong keyword against objectives because now they can't Mm -hmm. move on to a KP or if you use it against someone's Jedi, you know that they can't move over to your VAP and tap it or move over and chop somebody up. The value of immobilize when you go from one to two, it's a huge difference. One way to get around it, a lot of Jedi these days, your Lukes, your Commander Vaders, your Yodas, Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes even your Palps, they've got burst of speed. So if you're worried about getting immobilized with say Boba's Whipcord, I like to hold on to that burst of speed if I can, if I, sometimes you gotta use it to dive when you have the chance, but if possible, I like to hold on to it so that they can never say, hey, you're not going anywhere this turn. Because if Boba yes. towards me, I pop burst of speed, I'm speed three down to speed one, I can still move yep. around a little bit. But there's one guy in this game who says no bueno to that. We've already talked about him. That's Cad Bane because he's got Immobilize sure. three. The cases where Immobilize three is going to be better than Immobilize two, it's not tons, but we've got lots of burst of speed Jedi. We've got lots of speed three Mandos. So the cases do exist in this game. The thing to remember with Immobilize, when you shut someone down from moving completely, it's incredibly powerful. But the other thing to remember is that you lose all of your Immobilize tokens, not at the end of the round, at the end of your next activation. Let's say you've got a Jedi who's Immobilized in your enemy's lines. Sometimes what you can do, if you can afford it, is just go and something like dodge standby. Because you finish your activation, you lose your immobilized tokens, and now later, when you spend that standby, you are speed two again, or mm-hmm. or whatever your native speed would be. So that is one trick you can do. Now, there's still power being the player who forced that decision because you say, hey, if you're going to move standby, again, you're not moving and tapping my VAP or doing other yep. things, and you're still only moving six inches instead of move moving 12 inches. But that is a little trick you can use to get around Immobilize. So that's why for me, it's my key keyword of the episode. Great keyword. All Jedi hates it. So thank you everyone for listening and sticking with us for now the second episode of Bomb Bad Generals. We're going to keep putting these out on the bi-weekly basis, so look for that. If you want to write into the show, you can do so at bombadpodcast at gmail.com. We might read it. We might... uh, acknowledge it on the podcast we might ignore you so don't get your hopes up but if you want to bombadpodcast at gmail.com and you can always reach out to us on the legion discord uh, degree and zischis so thank you so much for watching the bomb mad generals and stay gungan this has been the bomb bad generals Listening to Bob Band Generals is not scientifically proven to make you a better Legion player. Side effects may include bad dice rolls, misfigures, aim losses, bankruptcy, divorce, vomiting, and sudden death. Ask your doctor if Bomb Band Generals is right for you.